That's right. Good morning, South Point. Welcome home. And uh, so glad that you're here joining us on this holiday weekend. If you're in the house, if you're online at YouTube or Facebook uh, or Church Online, maybe you're watching this back later in the week, uh, just honor that you would spend some time with us. And uh, I want to give a shout out to our veterans. Thank you so much for your service. Let's give them a hand. And uh, you know, there, are, there are times when I uh, regret not having served um, but a lot of that is, is because I have probably a romantic view of what it's like to actually serve in the military from the movies, right? And um, watching a, a good war movie is probably like watching Grey's Anatomy and going, that's what it's like to be a doctor, right? Um, but I can remember uh, as a late teenager watching Saving Private Ryan and them storming the beach and thinking like, man, I, I wonder if I would have the courage in that moment uh, to step up and to storm the beach. But you know, the reality is for most of us, we've been talking about this, we'll never have a singular opportunity uh, to save the day. That, that's unlikely to happen. Um, we're not gonna make the cover of the newspaper or the nightly news. But the series that we're in circles is really around this idea that um, while we may not get one big chance, we get thousands of chances every day with the people around us um, to make an impact and, uh, and to save the day one day at a time. And so for, for our immediate friends and family, the circles look like you know, uh, family, family and friends, uh, community and uh, the people around us to the strangers that we run into every day. Every single one of you uh, has uh, an orbit of people that you influence. Every person uh, has a circle where we have the opportunity to influence them uh, in the name of Jesus. And so here's the thing. We're crazy enough to believe that you are God's plan A for the people that God puts in your life. Um, because in the same way that, that uh, you're unlikely to be the, st the hero in somebody else's story, most likely you've never been rescued from a near-death experience um, or, or lived because somebody diverted the asteroid, right? Um, in the same way, your life has been shaped and formed by momentary kindnesses um, where somebody stepped in and gave of themselves so that you could experience uh, the life that was meant to be lived. Uh, and so it looks, it looks like, you know, the coach who maybe uh, spoke a word of encouragement to you, a teacher who said, you have what it takes. I, I see something in you. Um, or maybe it was a neighbor who brought you a meal on a, on a bad day uh, or a friend who fixed a car for you in a time when you, you really needed help with that repair. Today's uh, message, we're, we're unpacking what it looks like to live a life in a way that when we do those things, it actually helps them not just go, wow, you're a nice person, but it helps them to see God. Uh, another way to say that in the bottom line for today is that an act of kindness is, is the way that we make the invisible love of God visible. Uh, have you ever had a great experience, maybe a restaurant or a hotel or a store, and you, you, you'll actually go fill out the survey at the bottom of the receipt or give a Google review or a Yelp. You'll go anywhere to say, wow, this was amazing. And it's not because the food was great or the room was comfy. Um, or the product worked, it was, it was a customer service experience you had. It wasn't the product, it was the, the person. And you want to go, man, this company uh, gave me a great experience. Uh, a few months ago, I stayed at an Airbnb, and uh, yes, the room was comfortable, the view was amazing, the coffee bar was well-stocked, but it, was, it wasn't any of those things. The, the reason I'm willing to go back to that place is not for any of that. It was because of my experience with the host, Michael. And so Michael, on the, the first day, swung by and dropped off a bag of peaches. And he said, oh, it's peak season. These are local. It's a big deal here in the area. And I wanted you to, to be able to enjoy this peach. Um, the next day, I mentioned that I had gone outside and looked at the stars at night. And he said, oh, it's great for the patio. But if you take this path down around to the front of the property, um, you'll be able to see it and just a uh, view like you've never seen before. Um, and he gave me his flashlight so that I wouldn't break my neck on the way down and get eaten by wolves, Right. Um, and so, like, there were three or four of these, these situations. None of them in and of themselves go, oh, that's a really amazing person. But collectively, it, it communicated that, that he was willing to give something of himself, um, his presence, his, his stuff, his um, time, so that I could uh, have a great experience. Uh, more than just being nice, he, he was giving of himself in a way um, that made me feel seen. And so I don't know, have you ever, ever experienced that? Somebody that just communicates, you matter and I see you. Uh, we, those things stick with us. And so at the end of the visit, I didn't just leave a, a good review. Um, I, I like gushed about how great 
the property was and how um, kind and generous Michael was because I wanted other people to have that experience. And um, here's what I want to say from that is that, that people share positive experiences uh, at a faster rate, hopefully, or what we want them to do is share at a faster rate than the negatives. In 2 Corinthians, Paul is encouraging the Corinthian church that like, hey, what you do matters. The, the choices you make um, make a difference. And they're like a letter of recommendation, a Google review of Jesus and whether or not following Jesus is worthwhile. Uh, he says it this way. He says, your lives are a letter written on our hearts. Everyone can read it and recognize our good work among you. Clearly, you are a letter from Christ showing the result of our ministry among you. This letter is not written with pen and ink, but with the spirit of the living God. It's carved not out of tablets of stone, but of human hearts. And so Paul's saying again, like the way that you guys are loving and giving and sharing and doing life together, um, it is supernatural. And it is making people see uh, the, the visible love of the invisible God. And, it, 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 and it's, it's happening not on tablets of stone, which is a reference to the old uh, the Ten Commandments or making sure you do the right things. It's, it's not about the outward appearance. It's about actually from the inside out, from the spirit, um, that at the character level, something is happening in them that is causing people to see um, and to see the beauty and the wonder of Jesus. And that's really, that's the, that's the reviews that we hear of Christianity in our culture, right? Like people all the time are like, man, Christian Democrats and Christian Republicans, the way that you hold on to your political views and your leaders just really helps me understand the kingdom of God. Right? That happens all, no? Too soon? Election day? Sorry. Uh, you know, the, the way that you fight for theological rightness and the way that you celebrate when, when a believer uh, slips and falls, it just really just oozes with inspiration. Um, the way that, that you treat other people who see gender and sexuality different than you um, just is really uh, winsome and encouraging. The, the way that you care for the poor and the marginalized, five out of five stars. Like highly recommend your brand of Christianity. If any of that makes you uncomfortable, then we have to come to the awareness that, that we've allowed ourselves to separate um, our beliefs from the way we actually live our life. Something is broken and, and disconnected. And, and we'd like to, to be able to, to separate those things. But Warren Wiersbe says that, no, those things are, are closer connected than maybe we realize. He says, what you believe determines how you behave. In other words, the way that you treat people demonstrates what you actually believe. Not what you say you believe, but what you actually do. And so what we're exploring today is this idea of biblical kindness. And I say biblical kindness because I don't want you to mishear me. I'm not saying be nice, right? But everybody wants to think of Jesus as a nice guy, but, but nice is not enough. Uh, nice is not a spiritual fruit. It's not a spiritual gift. Uh, when I say spiritual fruit, I'm talking about Galatians 5, where, where Paul is saying, hey, um, when you believe in Jesus, when you become a follower of Jesus, there should be evidence in your life that something is changing. You shouldn't be like other people. Um, there should be a byproduct that is being produced out of your life. Um, and he says that those things, the fruit of the Spirit, are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. And so, again, this, this idea that all of this should be coming out from the follower of Jesus. And religion wants to attach good behavior and beliefs and, and uh, morals onto us from the outside. But, but Jesus says no, or Paul says no, that this should come um, from the transformation of the Holy Spirit from the inside out of us. And uh, this idea of, of uh, fruit and what it comes from the inside of us is really the most important thing. Earlier in that same chapter, Paul is talking about the law, the do's, the don'ts, the rules, the regulations. And he says, really, none of that matters compared to one thing. Uh, he says, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself in love. Or another way to say that is that kindness is love in action. Kindness is not a feeling. It's not an emotion. We don't feel kindness. Uh, we, we do kindness. We express faith through love. Uh, we, we see that when Jesus comes across something that, that makes him sad or angry, he doesn't just write it down in his journal. He does something about it. He engages and takes action. Matthew 9, uh, Jesus comes up to a crowd and, and it says this. He says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. 
Um, it doesn't say that he went away sad. It says that he then went on to, to teach and preach and heal. He took action. Kindness requires a response. Uh, now, kindness isn't all sunshine and butterflies. Uh, Mark 10, Jesus encounters uh, the young or rich guy, and, and this guy uh, is, uh, you know, has, has things to do, moves to make. And so he's talking to Jesus, and he's like, hey, what, what do I got to do um, to get into heaven? And in other words, like, what's the, what's the minimum standard? What do I, what I have to do uh, in order to go to heaven? And so Jesus points to, back again to the Ten Commandments, says, hey, don't kill, steal, lie, cheat, you know, that kind of thing. And that guy says, hey, no problem. I don't uh, drink, smoke, or chew, or go with girls who do. Like, I'm, I'm good. Check that box, right? And that's where Jesus would go, like, oh, great job. But instead, um, it has a statement, and it's an, it's an odd statement. It, it feels like it doesn't fit. And, and it says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. That's the whole sentence. It's like, you can just hear the sigh of like, <sighs> and so I don't know if you've ever sat down to uh, uh, talk with your kids. You're going to lecture them. You're going to gently rebuke them. You're going to um, give some, some feedback that's, that's difficult. And you just kind of pause and there's like an internal sigh that happens because you know that some lessons are just learned the hard way. And so it's like Jesus, instead of arguing with this guy, he goes, you know, just out of love, in kindness, he replies and says uh, that, that he should sell all this stuff, give it all away, and then come and follow him. And that's not prescriptive for everybody. Um, it's because for this particular person, his stuff owned him instead of him owning his stuff. And, and Jesus knew, like, the kind thing to say to him was the road that you're on isn't going to take you where you want to go. Come and follow me. And, um, and so I want us to see that sometimes kindness isn't the same as just being nice. Uh, another thing that you can do when you're just being nice is you can just be quiet, right? Like, uh, what, what's grandma say? If you don't have anything nice, don't say nothing at all, right? And so sometimes if you're in a, in a meeting and your boss or your coworker gives a terrible idea, you know, you can just let everybody else talk. And you don't have to offer your opinion, and that's, and that's nice, but that's not the same thing as kindness. Kindness is love in action. So a quick comparison here. Nice is externally motivated. It's, it's I want to have a smile on my face. I want you to like me. I want to, uh, you know, keep things on the surface. Everything is good. Kindness is internally motivated. It's something that's coming from inside of me that, um, that my character is being formed and shaped. And out of that uh, place comes the response. Uh, nice is what's best for me. It's I'm going to be nice to you so that uh, reciprocity, right? Like you're going to be nice to me later. I'm going to need you to be nice to me one day. So that's what nice is. Uh, lastly, it's the path of least resistance. Often I can be nice to people just because it's just easier to deescalate and move on, right? Somebody's a jerk and you just nod and smile and move on. Um, but kindness is willing to pay the cost. Sometimes the cost is our time, our energy. Um, sometimes it's our resources, uh, you know, the, the kindness requires something from us. Uh, our time today is split between baptism and kindness, and so I, I have to move this along pretty quickly, but I want us to really grab this idea that nice uh, isn't enough. Kindness, in the biblical sense, uh, is supernatural. It is otherworldly. It is, again, the way that uh, we help people see the invisible love of God. And kindness is something that this world is, is sincerely lacking. Uh, I was hanging out with a friend this week who's a, a police officer about an hour up the road, and, and he was recounting a story from just this week. And I just want to say to you first responders who are part of a family's worst days, um, thank you for what you do. And, uh, and I'm going to share a story, and it, it's, got, it's a little graphic, but I'm going to not be gratuitous. Um, he, he described a scene from this week where a man was in a car, a single car, a single guy, cruising down the road. And uh, this was a, a busy street in the middle of the afternoon. And he uh, lost control for some reason, came off the road, hit a tree or a sign. Um, after some time, the car was involved in a fire. And unfortunately, the man did not make it, um, which, you know, that, that kind of thing unfortunately happens in the world that we live in. The frustrating part of the story is that, again, this was the middle of the afternoon on a, on a busy street where he said hundreds, potentially thousands of people drove by. No one stopped. No one. 
And in the investigation afterwards, it was, it was apparent that the story didn't have to end that way. There was time, but no one stopped. And when I heard that, man, I was just, I was angry and I was indignant. And I was like, if I was there, I would have done something. Like, you look like a nice guy, but you would have done something, right? All of us would have done something. And so as I, I thought about that, I thought, you know, for the, there may have been a couple people who saw something happened and didn't stop, and that's on them. But I, I have to believe that for the other hundreds of people, they just didn't see what was going on around them. Their eyes were on the bumper in front of them. Their eyes were, their, their mind was on soccer practice for the night or, or their problem with a teenager or their marriage that's struggling or um, where am I going to take mom for cancer treatments? That They had their minds in other places and they just didn't know it. And so I don't want to be uh, sensationalist, but I, I think that there are people around us that are trapped and their lives are on fire and we're just driving by doing our own thing because we don't know it. And uh, last week, Pastor Matt shared the stats on the epidemic of loneliness that, that not just in America, but all throughout the world, um, people's lives are on fire with loneliness. Um, people's lives are on fire with shame and guilt and regret and depression and anxiety. And, and there are people, maybe even the sound of my voice, who are, uh, have a plan and a thought of, of taking their own life. And I would just say, like, it, this message, if you would just hear the heart of God that uh, he's for you, that life is worth living, and, and that there are people who are for you that want to stop and help. And so I just want us to see that, that life is going on around us and people are struggling, and the fire extinguisher of kindness could be the thing that saves their life. So this week, I want to um, just offer us a kindness challenge. When I was preparing this message, I promised I didn't know this. Did you know that today is actually World Kindness Day? It's a thing. You can Google it. Uh, so on our social media, if, you know, if you're not sure about what you can do to be kind, uh, we'll put a social media post out with lots of ideas. Um, but it's World Kindness Day. And, and we're going to take these three things. We're going to slow down. Um, I, I'm not talking about your life. I'm talking about my own. I, I run at a pace often where it is not conducive to me giving a rip about your problems because I, I just don't have time and capacity to realize it. And so I know in my own life, I have to slow down so that I can hear and listen and be pre give people the gift of my presence. Um, and I can't do that if I don't slow down. Uh, and I can't care if I'm not aware and so I, I have to be willing to, to slow down enough to see the problems that are in front of me uh, so that I can do something. Second is we're going to go small. There's a voice inside your head right now that says, go big or do nothing. And that is a lie. That is a lie from the enemy that, that wants to diminish your contribution and what you bring to the world. Uh, and so if there's something in you that says, I have to, to like have this grand plan, um, I don't think that's, that's the, the, the obvious next step. Uh, in fact, I would offer this of Jesus is I, when, I, when I see the Gospels, I don't see a single time where Jesus fixed a problem. He only met needs. And what I mean by that is, is he didn't start a feed the children organization. He just fed people, right? He didn't uh, start a, a counseling center. He just listened to people. Uh, and, and so absolutely, we need followers of Jesus uh, to uh, fight for systemic change. We need them to speak up for the underrepresented. Um, we need people of, of Christ to tear down walls of hostility, to start nonprofits and ministries. We need you to do that. And if that's what God's calling you to do, then do it. But, but Jesus, for Jesus, it was enough just to meet the need and to love the person in front of you. And so that's what we want to do this week. Uh, lastly, we're, we're going to listen to God and we're going to do it. And so what I mean by that is as you have your eyes on that, that you're looking for needs around you and, and something becomes apparent, you go like, oh, should I buy lunch for that person? Or uh, should I pay for the groceries for that mom who looks like she's struggling? You don't have to spend a whole lot of time going, oh, God, is that what God wants me to do? Like the devil doesn't want you to be kind. That he's not whispering in your voice, do a nice thing, right? Um, so you don't have to struggle too much. Just listen to what God's saying and, and do it. Um, when you roll up to the, the stop sign and the, the guy's out there panhandling, um, maybe roll your window down and, and talk to him like he's an actual human being made in the image of God, um, fully human, whether you have cash on you or not, and, and just give people dignity in the moment. Uh, if there's a guy in front of you that's berating the minimum wage employee about a policy they don't like, that the kid has no opportunity to change, you know, 
You can diffuse that conversation. The kind thing is not to be silent and to keep walking. The kind thing is to engage that and diffuse that in the name of Jesus, right? And then when we're done, we're going to leave a tip on the iPad, even though we really don't want to, right? Like, it's, a, it's annoying. It's a tip for things you didn't use to. And that's the kind thing to do when somebody's having a bad day. Uh, here's what I want to say about that. You, you don't know what's on the other side of an act of kindness. It, it may be that, that through that act of kindness, you have the opportunity to tell somebody um, specifically how Jesus has changed your life and, and shown kindness in your life. Um, you may have the opportunity to invite somebody to church to say, hey, I don't have all the right words right now, but maybe come and, and hear what Pastor Matt has to say and he'll tell you about Jesus, right? Um, maybe uh, you'll have the opportunity to pray with somebody. You know, they may not be ready to like hear a whole lot about, uh, about Jesus, but they're willing to let you pray for them. And it may be none of that. Just serve them without an agenda and see what happens. See what door God opens. Uh, you never know what's on the other side uh, of your act of kindness. And here's what I'd say. I, I don't know. Uh, an act of service will, may or may not change their life, but it will always change your life. It, it'll always make your life better. Proverbs says it this way, whoever pursues righteousness and kindness will find life, righteousness, and honor. It's actually good for us. Uh, we can be selfish if we want to. Take the, take the selfish angle. It's good for you to be kind. Uh, the scientific translation is that uh, our brain is actually hardwired for kindness. That when we uh, show kindness, we experience higher levels of oxytocin and serotonin. Uh, we have decreased blood pressure, lower anxiety and depression. It, uh, kindness is a natural antidepressant. Uh, it, it actually uh, creates what, what researchers call a helper's high, right? Uh, and, and so here's the thing, guys. There's more at stake than just our own benefit. There's more at stake than the simple act. Um, what we're doing when we show kindness uh, is that we are pointing back to Jesus, that of what he's done for us, uh, and, and that he leads the way in kindness and generosity. Uh, and Titus Titus, he's talking about the cross. Um, and there's nothing nice about the cross. There's nothing nice about being beaten uh, and mocked and abandoned and hung on a cross. But, but the way that Titus describes it is he says, but when God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us, not because we were righteous or the things we had done, but because of his mercy, he washed away our sins giving us new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out his spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Because of his grace, he has made us right in his sight and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. Um, I cannot exaggerate to you the kindness and generosity of Jesus into your life. And when we choose kindness, we're simply reflecting that back into the world around us. Now today, as we transition, we are celebrating the kindness of Jesus uh, through the act of baptism. And so I want to take us through a few minutes of, of what does it mean? Just in the same way a small act of kindness can change the direction of your life, a small act of obedience can change the direction of your life as well. And so today, uh, I'm going I'm to ask you that if you put your faith and trust in Jesus, if you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you haven't taken this step of, of obedience to be baptized, that today is your day. Um, and if you haven't done that, if you haven't accepted Jesus, that today could still be your day. Uh, we're going to quickly look at the scriptures about, and see this connection, this chronological connection between believe and then be baptized. Uh, over and over and over we see believe and be baptized. And then we're going to do it. And not like, are we going to sign up? Nope. Are we going to do a class? Nope. We're going to do it. And uh, that means that some of you came here dry and you're going to leave here maybe not so much. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And now, all of a sudden, I can, I, can, I can feel the tightness happening in your chest. Nobody's going to make you do anything you don't want to do. Um, there's somebody here who's never been to church, and they're like, see, I told y'all Christians were crazy, so I don't go to church. Nobody's going to make you do anything you don't want to do. But I'm going to explain the correlation between first believe and then be baptized, and then we're going to do it. Uh, the Bible tells us that in the beginning, God made everything, including men and women. We lived in perfect relationship with each other and with God. And then, uh, that's good news, then we uh, chose our own way. We said we don't want to be under the authority of God. We want to do things our own way. Uh, and we separated ourselves from God. That happens very early in our life um, because the, the scriptures tell us that we're actually born this way, this bent towards sin. You know, Kyle, I think people are naturally born good. 
And I would say, have you had kids? Because <laughs> nobody taught my kids how to be, how to bite or scratch or kick. Um, or their favorite and first word is no, right? Like there's something in us that's naturally bent. And that, that concept is called sin. That condition is called sin. And sin doesn't mean you're a terrible person or an ax murderer. It means that, that you've missed the mark, that you don't measure up to what God expects and deserves. Uh, and, and so um, as we continue to choose our own way, we dig this hole in this, and separate to where we can't get back. Um, and so what we do is we do religion. And all religions uh, around the world are, we, we work our way back towards God. And we, we strive and struggle and say, God, I'm going to make it up to you and show how good I am. But the problem is we never know really where we stand. And so Jesus said, hey, that, that doesn't work. You're never going to be good enough. Um, and, and so Jesus flips the script and comes to us. He lives a perfect life. And it shows what it, what it is to be not just in relationship with God, but perfect relationship with, with the people around us. Um, he then says, I'm going to lay my life down for you. Um, not just take the punishment for you, but instead of you, the punishment that you deserve. Uh, I'm going to lay my life down. And then through the power of the Spirit, God raises him from the dead. And all that you have to do to receive uh, the, the benefit of Jesus taking your penalty uh, and making you right with God is to believe. It's, the, it's called the free gift of salvation. And so if you receive that free gift, whether it's in this moment right now or it happened 30 years ago, I baptized somebody in the first service, has been following Jesus for 35 years, and today was the day they took this step. Um, but if you have received that free gift, the scriptures say that your next step is to be baptized. Uh, in 2 Peter, Peter is explaining this good news, bad news to people, and they go, hey, Peter, you're right. Um, we have messed this up, and we need Jesus in our life to make it right. And um, uh, Jesus doesn't say every head down, every eye closed. Uh, you know, we're gonna ask Jesus into our heart. No, he says, okay, here's what it looks like to follow Jesus. Uh, verse 38, each of you must repent of your sins, turn to God, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want us to focus on the, on the, the pattern there. Believe, uh, repent, sorry, repent and be baptized. And repent sounds like bullhorn guy. If you've ever been on, out in the city, you know, there's somebody yelling, repent. And um, it's, it kind of feels icky. It just means to, to turn around, to change your mind. And so as we, as we turn towards Jesus and we say, I, I don't want to keep going my own way, uh, and we turn towards him and we say, uh, I'm going to put my faith and trust in Jesus. That's what it means to repent. Uh, he continues, this promise is to you, to your children and to those far away, all who have been called on the name of the Lord. It says this invitation is for everybody. This is for everyone. Uh, if your heart is pounding right now, it's for you. It's for your children. I love that he says, for those who are far off. Because there's somebody here thinking, you know, I, I want to do this. I want to go get my life right and come back and do it next time. And I say, friend, that's not the way this works. We don't, we don't come to God when we have ourselves cleaned up. We come to God because we don't have ourselves cleaned up. Uh, and so uh, don't let that hold you back. Today could be your day. Uh, he continues, those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day, uh, 3,000 in all. We go, wow, 3,000, that's incredible. Um, but I don't want us to focus on the number. What I want us to focus on is this word, that day. That it wasn't make an appointment and make a plan to be baptized. It was believe and be baptized. Uh, over 27 times, just in the book of Acts alone, we see this pattern, believe and be baptized. And so if you haven't made, uh, if you've decided to follow Jesus and haven't taken a step, today's your day, or... If you were baptized before you, were, before you believed, um, then maybe you want to reconsider, have you been baptized according to the scriptures? So in my uh, last couple of minutes, because you've already gotten 1.5 messages, uh, we're going to cover a few obstacles to obedience in this area. Uh, and the first is confusion. We don't want you to be confused about what baptism is. Um, the word baptism itself, there's nothing inherently spiritual or Christian about it. It just means to immerse to submerge, to dunk. And so that's why we got this Jesus hot tub up here. We're gonna put you all the way in and then all the way out um, because the word literally means to submerge. So that's why we do that. Um, what is baptism? It is the outward symbol of an inward decision. Uh, I love weddings and uh, weddings are the public declaration that, that two people have uh, found love and they want others to come and share in that joy and excitement. Uh, in our Western culture, you write, first you fall in love, 
and then you get married. Unless this is some weird reality show, you don't try to like get married and then hope you fall in love. Uh, and so in the same way, baptism comes after deciding to follow Jesus uh, and to receive the love of Jesus. Uh, we, we don't baptize ourselves into faith or baptize ourselves into, into like hoping that it, it all sticks. Uh, first, we fall in love, then we get married. To, to follow the metaphor, uh, it, it's the, baptism is the wedding band of faith. That uh, when, when Lindsay and I got married, uh, I put on this ring as a reminder of the vows, the promises, the love um, that I have for her. And, and it reminds me of that moment. Uh, the second thing it does is it says, sorry, ladies, all of this is off, to, you know, off limits. Uh, you know, it's, it's both, right? It, it's for myself and it's for other people. Uh, and so the, the wedding band itself isn't where the power is. Uh, if, if I drop this, if I lose, which by the way, if you knew me and I haven't lost this, this is my original issue, you'd be amazed, okay. But if, if I lose it, if I drop it, am I no longer married? No, of course not. If, if somebody comes and picks it up and puts it on, are they married? No, because it's the ring isn't where the power is. The ring is in the union, the invisible union that's already happened and, and can't be uh, taken away. So that's the wedding band of faith. It is not what saves us. It is not uh, required for salvation. Um, you're not going to get to heaven and God's going to go, did you accept Jesus? Yes. Were you baptized? Ooh, you know, end up back of the line. Uh, but it is celebrating what God's done in your life. And so if there's something in you that's going, I'm unwilling to, to demonstrate my faith publicly, um, do, do you really understand what Jesus has done for you? Is there something, is there, is there something that would hold you back uh, from making that statement. Uh, baptism, even the mechanics of it, is symbolic. Um, the, the symbolism uh, comes from passages like Colossians 2, where it says, for you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, and with him you were raised to new life because you trusted in the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. Uh, and so we lay you back, again, just enough to get your nose wet, get you all the way under the water, uh, to symbolize you're dying to your old self um, and in your own power and your own strength, and you're being raised to new life in the power of the Holy Spirit to walk in newness. And so that's why the, the theme for baptisms here is risen, that we are risen with Christ. Uh, another thing that might keep you is pride. Uh, and, and the question pride asks is, what will people think of me? Right? What will people think of me? They, you might go, you know, I don't want to look super spiritual. I'm not. I'm just trying to figure it out. I'm just working on it. And I don't want to get baptized. And then people have these expectations of me. Um, that, that's not a thing. Uh, you might be thinking, hey, I, I don't, what will people think of me? I'm a volunteer in the kids' ministry or the worship team or a small group leader or I'm on staff. Uh, guys, true story, I was on staff at a church when I got baptized, when I realized I could, should, and wanted to get baptized. So don't worry about it. Um, what will other people think? I don't know. But, but here's what I do know. This room is full of people who couldn't be any more for you, um, who, who will cheer our faces off as you take this step of obedience. And so don't worry about what other people think. Know that we are for you. All right. Uh, don't let pride keep you from the water. Uh, I also I especially want to speak to men. The first service um, had this a whole family, three generations, uh, uh, husband and wife, a daughter, her sister, and both of her parents. And it was this powerful demonstration of what God can do in a whole family throughout the generations. And, and I love that there were men getting baptized because um, this, is, this is not to say it's less, less significant for women and children, um, but there's something prideful in us guys that goes, again, I don't want to look foolish or silly. And um, there's just power and strength in leading your family uh, through this experience. So don't let pride keep you back. Um, all right. Um, last thing, it might, pride might, might tell you, hey, I already did this when I was a kid. And if, if uh, you were baptized, like my kids at seven, eight, nine years old, they understood the good news, bad news of Jesus, um, and they received him as, as Savior. And so they were ready. And if that was you, great. But some of you got baptized because mom and dad said it was time um, or because you were told that you might go to hell if you don't get baptized, right? Like, you know, okay, five minutes in the water, I can do that. Um, and, and so we want you to do it on your terms in your time. Lastly, I don't want fear to be, to be an obstacle. Um, I don't want fear to keep you back. And, and maybe you were like me, uh, you were baptized as an infant in, in a different church tradition. And, and 
you don't want to betray the family tradition of your parents and your grandparents. You don't want to hurt them and what they did. Uh, and I would say as a parent, I want you to know that what they were doing, um, even though it might have been called baptism, is this idea of dedication, that they were hoping and praying that, that one day you would come to faith in Jesus and make this decision for your own. Uh, and so what you are doing in this moment is not a betrayal of that baptism. It is the fulfillment of that baptism, um, that, that your parents and grandparents would love to know that you would follow Jesus for yourself. Uh, some of you are afraid to do this because you're thinking, again, what if I mess up tomorrow? Um, you're going to mess up tomorrow. In fact, uh, there's, there's going to be maybe increased pressure from your enemy who wants to discourage you if you take this step. And so know that you're not signing up for perfection. You're signing up for obedience. Uh, and then lastly, the voice might be telling you, you do this, but do it next time, right? Uh, wait until mom, grandma, grandpa can be here, your, your friends, your neighbors. Wait until the right moment. Uh, and I would say, I don't think that's the voice of, of God either, that we have professional videographers and photographers that are way better than our iPhones. Um, and, and, and I don't want to be uh, crass, but one day you won't stand in front of God with grandma and cousin Jim. You will stand before God alone. And this moment is really for you and for God. Um, so don't let fear tell you to push this off. And lastly, for you really spiritual folks who have been following Jesus for a while, you might go like, hey, I'm going to pray about it. And again, I want to say, you don't have to pray about obeying God. Uh, that when I tell my kids to go clean their room, they don't go, I'll pray about it, right? <laughs> uh, we don't have to pray about doing what God's already told us to do. Don't let any obstacle cheapen your, your yes to Jesus. Um, I promise, you will not regret. If you, if you take this step and you get baptized today, you won't regret it. But if you don't, there's a good chance you're going to walk out today and go, I wish I would have and I should have. Um, and so that, that's it. That's, that's the whole cell on baptism. How are we going to do this? And so, again, you may have come here not planning on this. A lot of people have already signed up over the last few weeks. And um, if you should have gotten some direction uh, from Walt and the team. And you'll come over this way in just a few moments. Um, but for everybody else, I'm going to pray. And then um, you're going to head out to the hallway. And Walt and Brandy and the team have everything that you could possibly need. Shirts, t-shirts, undergarments, deodorant, hairspray, hairbrushes, hair products for all kinds of different people, uh, oils, powders, ointment, whatever you need that would keep you from taking this step of obedience. Our team has already thought of that and has that for you out in the hallway. So all you have to do is head out to the hall and get whatever you need, and then we'll come back and we'll walk you through it. And uh, so that's the plan. Again, when I pray in a moment, I'm going to ask any parents that have kids that are being baptized, I want you to go immediately after the song uh, and go and grab your kids. And I'm going to ask everybody who has kids to also go back and grab, grab them. And then please come back and, and share this moment with your kids. The reason that we're having you go get your kids is so that our volunteers who serve in the kids and student areas um, can share in this moment. And so uh, we want them to be able to participate as well. And so that's why, again, when we pray, parents, please go and do that. If none of that applies to you and you don't have kids with you, would you stay put so that we don't congest the hallways and things? The rest of the service is only going to take about 10 minutes and, uh, and we'll celebrate this moment together. All right. Again, I'm going to pray. And then you're going to find every ounce of courage that you have and you're going to go out and we're going to do this together. And uh, then the worship team is going to lead us in a song called Reckless Love, which reminds us uh, of the overwhelming, incomparable love of God. And it's the reason that we're compelled uh, to follow him. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, thank you uh, that we can never be nice enough to get to heaven. Heaven's not full of nice people. Um, it is full of people who have surrendered to Jesus. And so, um, God, as we surrender our lives to you, um, the scriptures tell us that, that the, the natural product of that is going to be uh, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness, um, that we would choose to, to put love into action and to serve the world around us. And so I just pray with courage that, that people all over this community um, will get served in Jesus' name. They won't even know it at the time, um, but there'll be uh, something in them that points back uh, to Jesus. God, as we take this step of obedience and baptism, uh, God, I am fired up uh, for the people who are going to take this step um, those who have already signed up and those who in this moment are going to find the courage to go out and uh, throw on some shorts and jump in the pool. 
It's not about uh, the ritual. It is about the person of Jesus and, and saying, I want uh, to, to uh, be reminded that my old life is buried and I'm raised to new life and power in Jesus' name. So God, we love you. We honor you. And we're so grateful to share in this moment. And on three, we're gonna go. One, two, three, amen.